Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord? Praise God. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we reverence the Lord? And let's stand before the Lord as we go in prayer. Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. Your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, why is that? Because that's where your presence is. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, to hear from a band. Or Father, we don't come into this place to be entertained. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word that you would have us to hear tonight, Father, that it would be seed sown on good ground, Lord, as we leave this place, that we would be impacted and prepared to do the work that you have called us to do in your kingdom. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Father, we ask that your presence and that your hand be upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and all across the world that are having a midweek service, whether it be tonight, whether it was yesterday or tomorrow. Father, we ask that your hand would be upon them, all of our brothers and sisters, and we thank you that we are many members of one body, all serving the purpose of building your kingdom. And Lord, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're being seated, go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew. I tell you, I'm excited about tonight's message. I've been thinking about this for some time, and... As you're turning to Matthew, let's turn to Matthew in the 14th chapter. An amazing story. The title of tonight's message, I guess guess you could say, could be controversial if you think about the title. The title of tonight's message, if you're taking notes, is called Jumping Ship. Now, when you think of jumping ship, I I, I, I was talking to some people today, and, you know, that term is often used for, uh, you know, a cowardly approach or, you know, somebody who's, who's abandoning uh, a, a, a way that they were doing or something like that. They're jumping, they're jumping ship. They're getting off board. They're, they're no longer on. But today I want to talk to you about jumping ship the other way. There was somebody who jumped ship in a faith way. And there was somebody who jumped ship in, in a manner that they, they tested themselves and they pushed themselves and they put, they, they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And today I want to talk to you about a wonderful man whom I love so much and his name is Peter. I'll tell you, I, I, you know, for those of you who don't know, there's, there's, there's a select few at this point who do know that I teach in the, in, in the Bible college in the fourth term. I teach church history. And one of my favorite things to teach about in church history, one of my favorite subjects in church history is the very, very beginning. When uh, the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell upon the, those in the upper room, the 120 that were in the upper room, and this man by the name of Peter jumps up on a soapbox, I guess you could say it wasn't a soapbox, but he jumps up and he begins to preach and teach to the multitude that were in Jerusalem at the time. Now, if you know anything about Peter, you know that some 50 days before, Peter denied Jesus Christ. And there were some times when Peter, you know, he he had gone through a, a, a great and mighty, I guess you could say, learning statement. And I think If there's anybody that I myself can relate to, it's Peter. Because we all know that John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he was good. And James was the brother of, uh, uh, you know, of Jesus. And so we know that there's, and then there's Peter. There's Peter who Jesus turned to and said, get behind me, Satan, too. You remember that? There was Peter whom, whom, who we'll read about today, who jumped ship and was the only other man in the existence of, of mankind that ever walked on water other than Jesus Christ. There was Peter who Jesus... Question three times, do you love me more than these, speaking of fish? I mean, Jesus Christ and Peter had a great relationship. And I tell you, for me, I love Peter because it's amazing to see the learning process of a man, a man who was a fisherman. Pastor Jim said that he was one time in Israel when they did a tour of Israel and he saw the place where, where Peter had set up his, his fisherman's business or his business and Peter was a wealthy man because he invented a, a process of taking the fish and storing them in, a, in what we would call a live well or he built a wall around so that there was water that the fish could stay alive in and he would sell fresh fish instead of, market, uh, instead of salted fish at the market. So Peter was, a, was an ingenious man. Peter was a zealous man. You know, you remember the story of when Jesus Christ was taken uh, at the garden into custody. Who was it that chopped off the guard's ear? It was Peter. Who was it 
that Jesus, as he was putting that guard's ear back on him, looked over to Peter and said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I tell you what, Peter is somebody that when I think about, he brings a smile to my face. Because we look at Paul the Apostle, and yes, that Paul the Apostle lived the life of a terrorist. He lived the life of a person that, that persecuted the church, and he was, he, was a, he was a bad person before his conversion. I love the story of Peter because Peter reminds me so much of myself where there are times, and I don't know if you're this way, but I know that I can say about myself open and honestly, there are times when my head may get a little bit big, when I may think that I know things, when I may think that I've just start to get it all together and now all of a sudden I hear the voice in the back of my head, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and all of a sudden I remember I have been put in my place. And I can relate to this man. I love this man. I love Peter. And I love the fact that here was this man that had gone through so many trials and he learned so much. And, and it, you know, I love, I always say this, Peter was a man that, that had foot and mouth syndrome. He was the man that always would just love to open his mouth real wide and stick his foot right into it. And Jesus was always there to correct him and teach him the ways. But you know what the beautiful thing is, is that Peter left a legacy behind because once Jesus Christ had gone to heaven, once that day of Pentecost had come and the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the church, it was Peter who jumped up and preached to the multitudes. It was Peter who became the first leader of the first church. It was Peter who founded churches all across the, the world as they knew it at the time. And here was this man that had made so many mistakes when he was with Jesus, but left a legacy behind because now Jesus is lessons in his life because he had been and walked with Jesus, he had learned. Today I want to talk to you about one of the many stories of this great man's life jumping ship, and how Peter, we all know the story, got out of the boat where nobody else did. The 12 disciples or the 11 other disciples were in that boat, maybe possibly more depending on the size of that boat. And there was one man who got out. His name was Peter. Now, I'm not going to preach to you a faith message that you would hear about this, a, a message of faith and say, well, you got to get out of the ship, you got to get out of the boat and just walk on the water like Jesus Christ. But what I want to do is I want to take a lesson from looking at Peter's life. And some of the things, because Peter was going through a learning experience. Time and time again, as we read about Peter's experiences with Jesus Christ, every moment we read about Peter, there was something that Peter got that he learned. And I want to look at what Peter learned, the good and the bad of this story, and see how can we take that and apply that to our lives tonight. So here we are in Matthew, in the 14th chapter. And I'm in Mark. I'm trying to figure out, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Matthew, the 14th chapter. And Jesus had just fed 5,000. The, the multitude had been thronging him, and now it was time for them to move on in their journey. And so verse number 22 picks up. We're going to read verse number 22 through 32. So bear with us as we push through these 10 verses. And here we go. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. I want to go back quickly, real, just real quickly, briefly to verse number 22. And I want to show you something. If we can pick up, put up verse number 22. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him. To the other side. Here's an interesting thought. Oftentimes Jesus would send his disciples to go somewhere before him to prepare the way of the Lord. Jesus Christ, as, as they were venturing across that sea on that boat, he went up to the mountain to pray. Interesting thought is that Jesus now knows that the disciples are alone, or the disciples are together and he is alone, and somehow he is going to have to find his way across the great sea where the storm arises. How does he plan on getting through the other sea? How does he plan on making his way through that? Do you think Jesus said, well, I'll just call a, a, a sea taxi and I'll meet them tomorrow and I'm going to have my vacation time over here. He knew what was going to happen before they knew it was going to happen. Another thought is that he sent the disciples out before them. He knew that there would be a storm that would arise. Jesus was no fool. He's God. God knows all things. We talked about that. We can't hide from the sight of God. He sees all things. So isn't it interesting that you think about us, what does that apply to you and I? That, just that very verse right there. Well, how about you and I being sent before the return of the Lord as his disciples to go and prepare the way like he sent his disciples across the sea? 
knowing that there would be storms in life for you and I to encounter. Yes. But there would be an example and somebody to hold on to. Interesting thought. That's not what we're preaching about today, but I just wanted to let you maybe, you know, as you go home tonight, kind of stew on that. Think about, hey, you know, Jesus knew about what's going on. So now we see verse number 23. And he had sent the multitudes away. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And now evening came. He was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, late at night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Could you imagine? Jesus has finished praying, and he says, well, it's time to take a walk. He walks out onto the shore of that sea, and he begins to step on the water, and he begins to walk on the water. Now remember, it says that the wind was contrary, so already there's a storm brewing. Already the sea is rough. Already the swells are moving around, and the boat is being tossed. And here comes Jesus. I'm going to walk out to them. Don't you think, uh, let's just, let me just give you, bear with me for a minute. Imagine this. I mean, I, this puts a smile on my face because you know Jesus was a playful teacher. You know Jesus loved to teach them through examples and through, through you know, parables. So he could have picked any way to arrive on the other side of shore. You know, he could have maybe walked around or walked across where they wouldn't have seen him and they would have gone to the other side after the storm and been like, oh man, we survived that storm. And then they, get, they pull up to the shore and here's Jesus standing on the dock. Hey, how's it? what? Whoa! But Jesus says, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to walk on the sea during a storm right past them so they can see who I am. You know in his mind he's ready to teach them something. He wants to show them something. How fun is that? So now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, verse number 20, saying, Be of good cheer, for it is I. Do not be afraid. And verse number 28 comes along, and Peter answered to him, and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down to the boat, he walked out on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Verse number 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt in verse number 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Here's an amazing story of a man, Peter, that is afraid for a moment because he believes he saw a ghost. And he hears Jesus say, no, don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter says to Jesus, hey, if it's you, let me come out on the water. You know, sometimes we don't give Peter the credit that he's due in this situation. We see, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that he focused on the surroundings and those around him. And he began to sink, but the Bible does say that Peter had come down on the boat and he had walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter, the only other man in the history of mankind who has ever lived that walked on water. Jesus Christ being born of the Holy Spirit and of man, half God, half man. But I guess you could say that Peter was the only full-blooded man that walked on the water. And then interesting enough is that as Peter's falling and he cries out to God, Jesus answers to him and says, oh, you of little faith, let me ask you this question. Do you think that this was an intimate moment between Peter and Jesus? Because why would Jesus say to Peter, oh, you of little faith, versus the 11 others who were sitting on the rail of the boat wide-eyed. The man of some faith, little faith, stepped out of the boat. He got out on the water. Now, he may have lost track of what he was doing, but he jumped ship. And I love how you and I can take a lesson from Peter. So today in my studies, the Lord was speaking to me about some things to take from Peter. And I've got three things for you today based out of this story of what we can do to learn from from our friend Peter, from the, from, from the great Peter in this story. 
So I've got three things for you today. Are you with me? Can we, can we go through three things looking at Peter's life and what he learned from this, what he took from this, and then how can you and I learn and take from this as well? So number one, I want to show you tonight, out of the 28th and 29th verse is this, is that Peter trusted Jesus' word. Peter trusted Jesus' word. In verse number 28, we read, we'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Verse number 28, Peter says, If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. In verse number 29, Jesus responds with one word, Come. He says, Peter, here I am. Come on out. And that's all Peter needed to get out of the boat in the middle of a storm and start to walk on water towards Jesus. He trusted in Jesus' word. Do you and I always, hello, do we trust in God's word? When we're standing on faith for finances, when we're standing in faith for our healing, when we're standing in faith for a move of God in our families and in our friends and those who we love, when we're believing for the salvation of those around us or those important to us, do we always trust in the word of God? Do we always treat it as how Peter did, as, he, as Jesus said that one word to him, come, it's all Peter needed. Here Peter climbs out of the boat, gets out onto the swim step, and begins to take that step, walks on the water towards Jesus because Peter knew that there was power behind God's word. Peter knew that there was power behind Jesus' word. You know, there was another storm that Peter was involved in. There was another time when Peter was on a boat and the disciples were on a boat and Jesus was on that boat. And Peter experienced the power of God's word. When the wind rose and the disciples were afraid and they go to Jesus and they wake him up and here's Jesus sleeping in the midst of the storm, they say, Lord, don't you care? The boat is being overtaken. We're going to die. Jesus says, oh, come on. <laughs> okay, that's a paraphrase. He doesn't say, oh, come on. <laughs> Jesus, you know the story. Jesus goes to the boat, and he speaks to the wind. Be still. <sighs> Glass. Peter saw the power of the word of God. He saw the sick healed. When the Roman centurion came to Jesus and said, my servant is sick, but I know that all I need from you is the word that he's healed. And Peter saw it. Peter saw the power of the word of God when Jesus was walking through the garden and he saw the, the tree that didn't bear any fruit and he said this tree would be cursed. And the next day that tree had withered from the roots. He saw the power of God. He saw the words of Christ that as when Christ spoke, Things happen. When the word of God came into action, things happen. He had sat under the teacher of teachers, God himself, Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said to Peter, hey, come. Peter said, that's all I need to do. That's all I need to have to defy the laws of physics and gravity and walk on water. He trusted in Jesus' word. Church. If we're to take something out of this message, we have got to understand that we have got to trust the Word of God wholly. We can't be half-hearted. And I know we've talked about the power of the Word of God oh, oh so many Sundays. And I know that, you know, you could say that we've beaten that dead horse. But let me tell you something. There's nothing dead about the Word of God. And you and I have got to learn, like Peter, all we need to hear is the Word of God in our lives and trust in it wholeheartedly. To stand out. We think of Peter as he's sinking and he cries out to God. Don't you know that Peter knew that there was a storm when he stepped out? We think of the illustration that the, the sea is glassy. When we hear the story as a children on the, on the felt board, that this Peter steps out and then the, the waves came. And then... The wind was blowing, and Peter lost track. But let me tell you something. The wind was blowing. The waves were already there, and Peter stepped out. So don't you know that it's a step of faith? It's one thing to step on water when it's nice and glassy and calm, because at least you know, all right, well, I'll sink gently. But Peter was in the white water. Let me show you what the Word of God says. In Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. In Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, the 29th verse, this is God speaking to those who were speaking against his word about the prophets. And he says to them, he says, 
Is my word, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? The word of God is alive and powerful. We've read that out of Hebrews. We've studied that on Sunday morning. But let me tell you something. The word of God is like a fire. The word that consumes all. That refines those things. And shows whether we're made of, of, of things that would be refined in fire or burned up in fire. But the word of God is like a hammer that breaks rock. Now, you know, I've said it before. I like to do woodworking. I have a few hammers in my collection. I have a, a mallet. And I have a sledge. Now, if I want to go out and break a rock to install a sprinkler system or do some landscaping in my backyard, I can grab my mallet that's made of rubber, that's used to coax things into position without marring or damaging them. And, and it does a good job at what it's done. But if I go out there with my rubber mallet and try to break up a rock, don't you know it's ineffective? But it says here that the Word of God is like a hammer that breaks the rock. The Word of God is like that sledgehammer. When you swing it, there's weight behind it. And when it comes into contact with that granite, when it comes into contact with that slate, when it comes into contact with that sandstone, don't you know something's given way and it's not that sledgehammer? Yeah. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you and I are up against rocks in our lives. Sometimes we face mountains made out of granite. Sometimes we face big issues. It's time for you and I, like Peter, to trust the Word of God and to understand, hey, the Word of God is like a hammer that would break that mountain, that would break that rock, that would smash that opposition ahead of me. And we got to jump ship and get out. You know one of the things I love to do most about my life? I taught, they, they taught me this. Man, they drilled this into us when we were in Bible school. As I love to speak the Word over my life. It's one thing to trust the Word of God. It's one thing to sit at a table or sit at a couch, open up your Bible and read it and say, great, that's wonderful. I'm glad that the Word of God says that. But now it's one thing to speak it, to pray it, to say, Lord, I thank you that your Word says about me that I am called, that I am chosen. I thank you that your Word says that you love me. And I begin to speak the Word of God over my life. And let me tell you something. It's like a sledgehammer those days when I wake up and I don't feel like getting out of bed because I think we all have those every once in a while. Those days when I wake up and I feel like I can make it at work today. Those days when I wake up and I'm trying to figure out where the money in the bank account went to. Let me tell you something. When I speak the word of God, it's like a hammer that breaks that opposition. It's like a hammer that destroys that rock in front of me. We've got to jump ship, church, you and I. We've got to understand that we can trust in the word of God like Peter. And all Jesus has to say is come. And hey, we'll do it. All he has to say is believe. And we'll do it. All he has to say is pray and we'll do it. All he has to say is open your mouth and we'll do it. You guys with me? Hello. We're talking about some things that Peter learned. I don't know about you, but I'm fired up about Peter. I love Peter. But you know, in this story, it's not always good. There is some bad to Peter's experience here, and we'll take a look at this on this one. Number two, tonight we're talking about some things we can learn about Peter. Number two is Peter lost his focus on Jesus. In the 30th verse of the 14th chapter, it says that, but when he had saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Here Peter is walking on the water and he lost his focus on Jesus. Sometimes in our lives, don't you know, we can lose our focus on Jesus. I love Keith Hershey's message on Sunday morning. If you didn't get it, you need to get a hold of that. You need to get on the podcast or the, the, the web. Get a CD of it, whatever you need to do to get it. I tell you what, if you didn't hear it, it will change your perspective on life. And we have got to keep our focus upon Jesus. And here's Peter walking on the water, and all of a sudden he's distracted by the circumstances around him. Don't you know that the circumstances of life are there to distract you and I from doing what God has called us to do? Jesus said to Peter, come. So therefore we see that it was the will of God that, that Peter walk on water. Because otherwise Jesus would have said, Peter, hold on. Let me tell you something. You know, let me come over to the boat. And here's Jesus sitting on top of the boat as the boat's rocking. And he's leaning his head over. And he says, listen, Peter, I appreciate your effort for wanting to come out on the water. But I just want you to know that I'm God. And that you're man. So, you know, let me climb into the boat and we'll, we'll, we'll resolve the storm issue. No, 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 no. Jesus was out there on the water, and Jesus said, come on, Peter. 
You want to get on the water? You want to get your feet wet? Come on, Peter. <laughs> so it was the will of God for Peter to be out there. Jesus told him, come on. He sent him an invite. But Peter, once he was out there, got distracted with things around him. The wind, the waves, the white water, whatever it was, the lack of his ability to swim, who knows? And so now Peter got distracted. And you know, life is like that. Here we are in the will of God, and all of a sudden, distraction comes our way. You know, get sidelined or, or get, you know, sucker punched by life, whatever. And all of a sudden, our focus goes from God, what was that? And we look over here and try to figure out what that was. And we look over here and try to figure out what that was. And all of a sudden, we start to sink. We lose sight of God. We lose sight of Jesus who's walking, who's in that storm, who's in the water. Yeah. You know, I remember there was one time when I was, when I was, uh, I just graduated from Bible college and some of my old buddies said, hey, let's go, let's go have a surfing trip. And so we started at Huntington Beach and we worked all our way, all the way down to San Diego over two days. It was fun. I'd, I've only surfed one time in my life and so I didn't know how to do it. Um, and I went and borrowed a friend's board, and I went with my friends. You know, we're standing there on the beach, on the sand, and we're looking at the waves. And I've never really done this. I've done it once before. I fell most of the time, didn't, you know. And we're looking at the waves and saying, ah, oh, they're no big deal. That's fun. Let's go out there and have a good time. But then as we begin to paddle out there, and now I'm not standing on my feet looking at waves 300 feet away. Now I'm laying on my stomach looking at waves breaking over my head. They seem a lot bigger. The reality of the matter is, is that sometimes we look at our opposition and we look at what things people are going through and we say, what's the big deal? Why are you getting distracted by that? Come on. But when we go through life, don't you know that it's just like Peter, like me when I was surfing, laying on my stomach. That wave is a heck of a lot bigger than it was when it was on the shore, even though it may have been the same size. Even though it may have only been a four foot wave, it was terrifying to me who had never done something like that to know that there might be consequence for me to try to ride this thing and land on my head. And Peter was the same way. And in the ship, there was a storm. And Peter knew that when he got out of the water, he was walking into a storm. But let me tell you something. When you step out on the water, that storm gets a lot bigger. Because don't you know the enemy wants to get you down? Don't you know that the world wants to break you of your spirit, take everything that you have, and tell you that your God doesn't exist? So don't you know that the things are going to fight against you even more so? So Peter lost his focus on Jesus. What does that take for you and I? What do we take away from that? We take away this, that there will be things in life that will try to draw our focus away from God. But we have got to understand and we have got to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse number 13, verse number 14, Jesus says, a few pages down, says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Are you and I going to be the kind that travel the broad open road who many find? Or are we going to be like Peter, the few, who say, God, if that's your will, tell me and I'll get out of the ship and I'll walk on the water in the midst of the storm to come to you. Because Jesus Christ said, hey, the road is narrow. The gate is small. You know, in our walks with God and our focus upon Jesus, I feel like we have an idea of what the road might be, the narrow road. And I'm going to put a picture on the screen. This is a road to Monument Valley. Go ahead and put it up, guys. We think that the road that is narrow and the gate is small is something like this, an open country road where we see, okay, I can see for miles that the road is straight, that the road is easy, that the road, yes, it is narrow. It's only a two-lane road. Sometimes we think that our journey following Jesus Christ and walking in the ways that Jesus Christ taught us, sometimes we feel like that road looks like that. Yeah, there's some distraction. There's some scenery along the way. But... For the most part, it's a wide open road where we can see for miles the things that come against us or come at us. But really, I think the road is more like this. Let's put that second picture up. This is a Chinese marketplace. There's a lot of people venturing on that road. And you know the designation of that road, the whole design of this road is to entice your attention from, attention from left to right. And you're journeying from one side of the street to the next side of the street, and you're trying to go from point A to point B, but don't you know that people are thronging you? People are walking that road the opposite direction that you are. They're bumping into you. 
There are people calling out to say, hey, come here, come here, come here. Look at this, look at this. Hey, 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 come here, come here. Just take one sip. Hey, come on, come on, come on. Come back to what we used to. Man, come on, let's have it like the old days. Hey, 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 come on, come on, look at this. And they try to get our attention. So the road is not this long, narrow country road, but this tight, squeezed farmer's market where somebody's trying to get your attention no matter where you go, where people are bumping into you no matter where you go. Jesus said that the road is narrow and difficult. The gate is, 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 is difficult. This road is not something easy, and if we lose track, if I'm following this guy in his white jacket and his pink suitcase... We say that that man is Jesus. If I lose track of him in that market, he's gone. And I'm going to get lost. And I'm going to be distracted. And I'm going to say, well, here I am. I'll buy a cheap suit. I'll buy some, some Asian fruit, whatever it might be. And I'll be distracted with what my point was, was to follow that guy. And we and I have got to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Because if we don't, like Peter, we lose track of why we we're out there. And all of a sudden, like Peter, we look around and say, why am I standing on water? Why am I not like the smart 11 other people that are standing on the edge of the boat looking at me like... <laughs> and we lose track of why we're out there. But if we keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, don't you know? Don't you know? That we know where we stand. That we know why we stand where we stand. And we know we can go beyond where we stand to where God has called us to be. Are you with me tonight? Last one for tonight, taking some things of, of Peter's life, of what Peter learned and gained from this is number three, Peter called to Jesus for help. And we see this in verse number 30, verse number 32. But when he had saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. I love this part. And immediately... And immediately, and immediately, we don't get the story of Peter saying, Lord, save me. He's guzzling and gulping water. His head is dipping below the surface. And Jesus is saying there, Peter, Peter. He says immediately, boom, the hand comes out. It's Jesus Christ pulling Peter up out of the water, pulling him up, bearing Peter's weight, again, defying the laws of gravity and physics. Do you get where we're going? Jesus Christ was a man. So he weighed somewhere between 150 and 190 to 200 pounds, depending on his size and stature. That's crazy for something of that size and stature with two feet with a small surface area to stand on water. But now, all of a sudden, he is pulling double the weight while he bears Peter in his hand. And don't you know that when Peter cried out, God was there? Because Peter knew that. He could stand on Jesus. The cornerstone for you and I. The foundation of our lives. The building block on which we stand is Jesus Christ. And don't you know, when you and I call out the name of Jesus in our time of need, there is a hand that comes down from heaven and bears our weight, bears our sins, bears our burdens, and pulls us out of the storm and the mire. All we have got to do is call on Jesus. You know, I had a test of my personality, a test of my spiritual walk with God a few weeks ago. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be open and honest with you. I don't want letters. I don't want emails. I know that after you hear the story, listen, understand that I know now that I was very stupid in what I did. Okay? So don't tell me that I'm dumb. I know. <laughs> we were driving along, and I have two dogs. And one of my dogs enjoys the air in her, in her face, and she hangs her head out the window. Now, some of the dog owners in here might say, oh, don't do that. I know. Here's why I know. I turned a corner, and my dog fell out of the car. Praise be to God, she wasn't hurt. We were driving about 35 miles an hour. She got banged up, but nothing serious. Loved on her. Oh, boy, did we love on her. We took care of her. She got hurt. But here's the test of where I, my spiritual, what, spiritual walk was at that time. We talked about Peter called out to Jesus. And as my dog flew out of the window and I looked at her in the rearview mirror rolling on the street, every profane word that I could think of in high school came out. 
Hey, I'm just being open and honest, all right? Pastors can say bad words too every once in a while. <laughs> and then, after I was done in my cussing storm because I thought, what a fool am I that I did something so dumb, then I called the name of Jesus. <laughs> Don't you know that Pastor Luke was totally convicted as he looked at his wife and she sits there on the side of the car going, <laughs> that's the face for tonight's service. And the Lord spoke to me and said, who are you going to call out to in your time of need? You're going to resort to what you think you know? Do those words that flew out of your mouth made your wife look at you like that? Didn't know you even had those in you? Did they make you feel better? The Spirit of the Lord came upon me. I'll tell you what, and I was just like, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me, because if there is a time of need, let me tell you something. Let's talk real. Yep. There was a time of need when somebody busted into a movie theater that I was sitting in. What would I say first if I had one thing to say before my life ended? Yeah. Would I say a bad word? Would I say, oh, you know, and then an explicative? Or would I say, Jesus, save me? Yeah. What would I do? Yeah. That's the real test of our spiritual walks, yeah. is in those time of needs. When Peter was sinking in the water, he could have said, throw me a life vest. But he said, Jesus, help me. Yeah. And we may sink, guys. Our life may go down in flames, it seems, and we have a decision whether or not we're going to call upon our family and our friends to rely on. We're going to call upon the situation around us and say, oh, man, I hope there's a sandbar in this pond that I'm in. And we can say, Jesus, help me. Yeah. And immediately the hand comes out of the water, pulls us out of the water. And Peter, Peter had to go through a time of trusting in God. In order to fulfill and be who God called him to be, Peter had to make mistakes. And Peter had to sink to know that God was there. But why? Because in Acts, the 12th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to there. Why did Peter have to sink? To call out to Jesus. Because in Acts, the 12th chapter, verse number 5. Background, verses number 1 through 4. King Herod had set out his hand to harass some of the church, and he had killed James, the brother of John. And he saw that because, this is verse number two, three, it says he saw because it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter. So now Herod has Peter in prison. Verse number five. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Peter had a support system behind him. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, when Herod was ready to kill Peter, when Herod was ready to do what he did to James, when Herod was ready to do what had been done long ago to John the Baptist, now it's Peter's turn. That night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between the two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping watch over the prison. Verse number 7, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, Put on your garments and follow me. And so he went out and followed him. And Peter didn't know what was done by the angel was real. Peter thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past Listen to this. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to an iron gate, an impenetrable force that leads to the city, which opened then of its own accord. Here is Peter standing before an impenetrable force, a solid iron gate, and as he looks at the gate, don't you know that the door opens by itself? opened of its own accord, and when they went out, they went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from them. And Peter realized now all of a sudden, he's no longer asleep in a prison. This was not a vision. This was not something that he was dreaming. This was not his last hope or his last chance at life. But now all of a sudden, Peter finds himself dressed and freed from prison on the very night he was to lose his life. But if Peter wouldn't have learned to call out to Jesus Christ, to put his faith in the hand that came down and reached and grabbed him, to say, hey, when you're drowning, I got you. Where would Peter have been? 
But then Peter, because he had trusted in God, rose to who God had called him to be, the leader of the first church. To be the great and mighty author of the word of God. To be the great and mighty leader of all the different churches in all the different areas. To go and travel and speak and to teach and to continue to learn. Why? Because he learned to call upon the name of Jesus. And when he did, point number one, he went back into and he learned to trust the word of God that says, I've got you. Like Paul the Apostle said, my grace is sufficient for you. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So where of all of this, these things that we've learned from Peter, while he jumped ship, we got to take away from this is that we always have got to trust God's word. Why? Because Peter trusted Jesus' word. We have always got to keep our focus upon Jesus and not get mixed in the raft and the mire of a world and what it has to offer because we would lose sight of the trail ahead of us because Peter lost his focus of Jesus. Finally, we have got to learn that we've got to cry out to God in our times of need and put our faith and our trust that the hand of Jesus Christ, the hand of God, the hand of the Holy Spirit himself comes down and grabs us out of our situation and says, I have you. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Praise God. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. Here's why. Not because I don't want anybody moving. Don't. Here's the reason why. is The Holy Spirit's going to minister to us, speak to each and every one of us. And when you get up, when you walk around, you get up, put your jacket on, walk out of here, people watch you. They look at you like Peter lost his focus. They don't listen to what's being said, and they watch you walk out. So give me just a moment more of your time. I ask just please stay seated for just a few more minutes. Let me ask you this question. I'll, I'll dismiss you in just a minute. But let me ask you this question, because it would be a shame for us to have a message today about jumping ship, about learning things from Peter's life, to have a great praise and worship and to experience the presence of God, but not give you the opportunity to examine whether or not you're going to find yourself in heaven or hell. Whether or not you're going to meet God face to face and spend eternity with him. So the question is this. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case. But if you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question. But let me say this, that nobody would know that answer except between you and God. So why don't we go over some of the answers that maybe you've had in your heart, maybe that you've come up with in your life. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm not sure that heaven or hell exists. I'm not sure that God is real. Just because you say in your head, just because you believe in your head that heaven or hell isn't real, because you're not sure whether or not God is real, maybe there's a God somewhere in heaven, but I don't know if he's involved in my life, doesn't mean that it's not. Doesn't mean that that's the final answer. You know what? A poll came out that said 20% of Americans nowadays don't believe in God or don't believe or believe in a form of God but not God himself. You know what the bottom line is? is just because you don't believe that heaven is real or because you don't believe that hell is real doesn't mean it's not true. God thought it important enough to mention it in his word. Jesus Christ is important enough to teach it in his teachings. It's important enough for you and I to quit playing games and to take it serious. Heaven is real. Hell is real. And I love you enough to be honest and be in your face about it. You need to shake yourself with that and get with God. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I hope I get to heaven. I think I'm going to get there. I sure want to go. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you hope that you're going to get to heaven that you're going to find yourself there? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you think that you're going to get to heaven that you're going to find yourself there? Like, I think I can. I think I can. If you think hard enough, you'll get there. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because you desire, you earnestly want to get to heaven so bad that God will reward you enough to say, okay, he wanted it bad enough, he got it. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that. You can't think, you can't hope, you can't want or will your way into heaven. It's just not that way. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or a Muslim, any other type of world religion. So doesn't that mean by default, by classification, that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? No, where will you find that? Well, you know, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, my parents had me baptized as a child. I was christened. I attended Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. We went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Listen, all my life my parents told me I was a Christian. All my life I've said that I'm a Christian. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because your parents had you baptized as a child, christened as a baby, because somebody blew smoke and water over you and said a prayer over you that you're going to get into heaven? 
Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter because you're sitting here today that you're going to get your way into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because somebody told you at one point in your life that you were a Christian or that you've given yourself the title or the name of Christian that you're going to get your way in heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that. You know, that's like me sitting in my garage calling myself a Honda Civic. At no point in my life, doesn't matter how much I give myself the name, would I ever become a Honda Civic. Who told you, where did you get the idea that because you call yourself a Christian, that means that you're guaranteed in heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Well, how about this? But, but Pastor Luke, you know, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven, because you've never cheated on your taxes, you don't drive over the speed limit on the freeway, you've even given to charitable organizations. Hey, how about for this, you young people, you wear Tom's shoes. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you're a good person, because you do good deeds, that you're going to get, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? No, where in the Bible will you find that? As a matter of fact, let me tell you this. The Bible says that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. So there's more to it than that. What is it? Well, we'll get to it in a moment. You know, you might say, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I grew up in church all my life. You know, I went through children's. I went through the youth group. Here I am today with my family. Now here I am today. I'm in church. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says because you warm a chair in, a, in an auditorium and listen to somebody preach the word of God, that means that you're going to get into heaven. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, I know, the, I know who God is. I know who Moses is. I know about John. I even knew about the story of Peter when he walked on the water. I've memorized John 3, 16 and some other verses. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because you know who God is, because you know who Jesus is, because you knew about Peter, because you've memorized John 3, 16 and a few other verses that you're going to get your way into heaven. Can you show me where it says that in the word of God? You know what the Bible tells us? That the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is? The devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is? Let me tell you something. The devil tempted Jesus when he was in the wilderness with scripture. So the devil himself has studied the scripture, yet because he has some memory verses memorized, it doesn't mean he's going to get into heaven. Then why should you think that you're going to get there because of that? Where did you get that from? Well, but, but Pastor Luke, I was a leader. I, I, I know the Bible. I've, I've studied the Bible. I, I, when I was in youth, in a youth group or a children's church, I volunteered at my last church. You know, I grew up in church. My parents took me there all of my life. I, I know about the Bible. I sang in the choir. I was an usher. Does that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Where in the Word of God do you see that? Because you car carried the pastor's Bible. Because you sang in the choir. Because you volunteered or to watch babies or you helped in the youth ministry at your last church. Where can you find in the Word of God that that means you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a story. In the book of John, in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus Christ. Nicodemus, the Bible tells us, was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. What does that mean? That means this, that Nicodemus had dedicated at least the first 18 years of his life, if not more, to studying and to memorizing the Word of God. In today's, in today's term, Nicodemus would be equivalent to a PhD, according to the Word of God. He had memorized the word. He had studied the word. He sang the word. Nicodemus was welcome in any temple to go and preach the word of God. And he comes to Jesus Christ and he asks Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? You would think that because Nicodemus had dedicated his life to studying the scripture, because he gave to the poor, because he wore all the right clothes, because he did all the right things, because he taught in the temple, because he was of the right, uh, the right group and the right social status, that Jesus would pat him on the back and say, man, Nicodemus, you just keep on going. But Jesus turns to Nicodemus and he says to Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, what does born again mean? You've heard that term. You've heard that word. You think, man, born again means crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. Born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Let me tell you something. God is not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after, church, your carnal knowledge of who he is. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. 
Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, speaking to the church, people like you and I, says to them, when I come back, I better find you hot, I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa! That's a shocking statement. It's designed to get our attention. What Jesus Christ is saying is when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you hot or he better find you cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm, he's going to spit you out, reject you out, cast you out of the kingdom of God as worthless is what that translation means. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means in relationship to your, in regards to your relationship with God. Lukewarm means this. It means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. You're floating around in your relationship with God. Occasional church attendance, token prayer here and again. Maybe you even wear a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. It means that you've been doing your own thing instead of God's thing. It means this. It means that you've got too much of the world in you to enjoy God, and you've got enough of God in you to not be able to enjoy the world. You've been riding the fence. Jesus Christ says, if you're lukewarm, you will be rejected from the kingdom of God and deceived in thinking you're going to get there. Wow. Shocking statement. Well, then, Pastor Luke, then how, how do we get to heaven? I'm glad you asked. You know, you might say, I appreciate the effort that you're going through. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get there the same. Let me tell you something. Let's not do it your way. Let's not try to get to heaven my way because we'll fail. We get to heaven God's way. And here's how we do it. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, hey, listen, no man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not try to get there my way. Let's do it God. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to hit my hand on the Bible just like that, real nice and loud. And when I get to that count of three, if that's you in this place, if you've never given your heart, never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've been living lukewarm, you're not sure. In a moment, if that's you, I want you to pop your hand up all together at the same time. We'll all do it together. What you're doing when you put your hand up is you're saying, you know what, I know, I acknowledge that I want to surrender. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to go forward with God. I want to be hot in my relationship with God so that I'm not cast out, rejected out as worthless from the kingdom of God. I don't want to miss it. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, somebody's going to see me. The person next to me is going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to embarrass you because you put your hand up. And even if you were embarrassed, even because you did put your hand up, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of eternity than a, than a, moment, of, a, a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? Because you couldn't raise your hand in a welcome and loving place? The decision is yours. Listen, God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. He's not going to make his way in. You have got to choose him. He's already chosen you. By sending his son, Jesus Christ, a beaten, bloody mess to die naked on a cross for you and I. To bear our sin and our shame so that we could accept him and give him all of our heart and all of our life in return. The decision is yours. You can't make the person next to you do it. Between each and every one of us and God. So who should raise their hand if you've never given your heart? You've never given your life to Jesus Christ in a moment when I count to three, you need to get your hands up. If you're not sure, you think, man, did I do this as a kid? I don't know. Maybe you've made it, never made a public profession of your faith before for Jesus Christ. If that's you, in a moment, you need to get your hand up. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to God in a moment, you need to get your hand up. We'll go forward for God all together, all at the same time. Don't risk it. Don't walk out of this place today without making sure. The Bible says that your life is but a vapor. Those people in Colorado didn't expect their life to end that night, last week. You don't know what tomorrow holds, so don't walk out of this place today without making sure where you stand before God. It's a gamble that you cannot afford to make. So all across this auditorium, all at the same time, hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you, if you've never raised your hand, or you've never, you've never given God all your heart, and you've never given him all your life, you're not sure, you maybe never made a public profession, you've been living lukewarm in a moment, if that's you, get your hand up. Here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. I got you, brother. One, two, three. I got you. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I got you. Eleven, twelve. Twelve wise people. If I saw you, put your hand down. Thirteen, I got you. Anybody else? Thirteen wise people. Fourteen, I got you, I got you, brother. Thirteen wise people. Where are you at? Number fourteen. Where are you at? Number fifteen. Give me a little wave so I can see you. I see you. Okay, I got you. 
14, 15. 15 wise people in the house. Where are you? I say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You need to do this. Get your hand up so I can see it. Put it right back down. If that's you in the house today, where are you at? Anybody else in the house today? Well, praise God for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For those 15 of you who raised your hand, I want to ask you to be bold. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. You said you were going to give him all of your life. You acknowledge that you want to give him all of your heart, all your life, by raising your hand. Now let us pray with you. Let us get some things into your hand to help you with your walk with God. So here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raise your hand or if you should have raised your hand, it's not too late for you. I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And get up out of your seat, get up out of your chair, and come meet me here at the altar. Let us pray with you. Let us help you today. You said you were going to give him all of your heart, all of your life. So come on, if that's you, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and come meet me up here at the altar. If that's you, come on. You can come. You can come. Come on. Come on. Out of your seat, out of your chair, from the family room. If that's you, come on out. Hey guys, listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is a new day. Today is the day you jumped ship in a good way. Hey, I want to do something. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This guy right over here waving at you. This is Pastor Dave. I'll tell you what, Pastor Dave is the nicest guy you'll meet. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life. So he's going to take you right over there and lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free literature, a book that our senior pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Very easy reading. Just says, hey, I just got saved. Now where do I go from here? Help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. And he's going to invite you into a program called a spiritual personal trainer, SPTs. You know, you see the personal trainer in a gym, somebody that helps you, comes alongside of you, helps you build those muscles and lift those weights to get strong. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend, somebody that meets you before service for five weeks, teach you some things for 15 minutes, teach you some things about the things of God, call you during the week to make sure you're eating the Word of God and you're getting the Word of God into your heart, into your life so that you get strong in the things of the Lord so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. So we're going to invite you into that. That's a five-week program. I encourage you, you need to get involved in that. And I want to ask you this. You watch what five weeks does to your life, and I want to ask you this. Commit to 12 months of sitting under the Word of God here at the church, to come to church and to get the Word of God in your life, and you see what the Word of the Lord will do in your life like it did to Peter. So give us 12 months of your life, and you see what God will do in your life. So if you guys would turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Dave. 